So a couple, th oh, my mic on, dude. I'll just talk super loud. A couple things, being born and raised here, that's about as much praise as I can absorb in two minutes, right? I'm, I'm too Minnesota to kind of have that kind of praise lauded on me. The other thing is I'm a former C programmer, so it's appropriate for me to do iteration zero. Uh, does anybody know what this picture is behind me? Any guesses? Someone in here has to know. Pardon? Uh, where is it? Anybody know where it is? Kazakhstan, right, it's Star City. So the last time I was working in Moscow, I went to the Russian uh, Space Museum, which is really interesting, with a kid that couldn't get a job with his rocket science degree, so he was writing web apps. Right, sort of tragic for dude, but he kind of started walking me through the Russian space program, and the Russians did a lot of things different than we did, and they beat us into space, and one of the things they did, and some of them are tough, so like we had this really pretty capsule that came down on a parachute and landed in the ocean, and the cosmonauts bounced somewhere in Siberia because the capsule was a giant steel ball. So that was your testing. Could you survive bouncing coming down from space? The other thing they did is that, you know, we have this really pretty vehicle that drives a Saturn V or some rocket out to the launch pad. The Russians don't do that. They drive it out sideways, and they let gravity do the work. So when the thing gets to the end, they push it up a little bit, but the bottom of the rocket is heavier, so it's really easy for it to stand up. And there's a whole bunch of things in their program that were, you know, they beat us in a lot of ways because it was just simpler. And it started me thinking that um, these two books are in the bookshelves at Dev Jam. And so I kind of have these two bookshelves. We have kind of a stock library of books people have read, but I have another bookshelf that I call Umberto Eco's library, which I stole from a guy named Echo, who says, you should have a bookshelf library with all the books you haven't read. Because most people are just, at, you go to their desk and they have all the books you have read. So these are in the red column, but the one on, on the left here just moved into that column, and they're really interesting bookends. Does anybody, who's read Founders at Work? Anyone in here? So this is like key for this audience. It's a Paul Graham Y Combinator publication where they just went and interviewed all these people that did these successful startups. And the thing you hear over and over again is that you can't be too certain that you're right. You have to kind of embrace uncertainty. You have to be very ready to be wrong. What your idea is is probably going to change. On the left-hand side here is a book about the exact opposite. It's the danger of certainty and arrogance of like, well, we have the requirements, we just have to build it. Like, just is the worst estimate that we give to each other. If you listen, when people get uncomfortable, they start throwing just in in front of things. And the guy is trying to say, what happens at big companies, not unlike a Best Buy, when there's a good idea, how does it die under the weight of its own mass or the gravity of the organization? How do these cool ideas reach escape velocity or not? And I thought, okay, well, that's a a funny idea, that could be a good vehicle. And so I kind of have been thinking a lot, I'm at companies, I'm sitting with a small group of people, maybe at a very large company, and they have great ideas. And I think, this is never gonna get out of this space. And I've often thought of like, there's this neat, healthy tension between product and learning and use and watching people interact with things that often has to go against the tension of structures that we have. HR structures, team structures, technology structures, if you think about it from a product perspective, are a made up concept that the people that we build things for don't care about. They don't care about front end and back end and engine and all that kind of language. Those are just ways we have to decompose problems. So if you think of like a small company, that pivots on this axis, right? It's more towards product learning. There's six people. Who in here has been in a company of six people or less? They were building a thing and you had to stay alive on that money, right? Everyone that just raised their hand know that everybody cares. You don't really worry about roles. You don't, might not even have an HR group. You kind of have more people doing more things. And then organizations kind of grow up and you get into larger, large-ish programs, organizations, and it doesn't have to go much from 60 to about like 16 or 26 for all these weight, all this structure to start happening. And some of the structure is natural. I'm not saying we should have mob software development done by like 200 geeks and just hope that osmotically we stumble into something that's coherent, because that doesn't work either, right? That, there's a whole bunch of people in the Agile community all the time that mistake crowds for collaboration. So they have everybody in every meeting because they want to be inclusive and all they end up with is more opinions and more collisions. But as things grow up, 
these, this level of complexity comes in. I stole this term, accidental complexity, from Fred Brooks. And I think it's a good idea because I see it happen in companies. Structure is sort of necessary, but structure that happens accidentally weighs you down. And so the next level would be a medical device company. <laughs> if you're a medical device company, right, I'm fond of saying you don't want to write a user story that says, as the pacemaker, I need to keep pacing dude so he doesn't fall down. Right, if you hand that to the engineers, they flip your bozo bit, game over. You're an idiot, process monkey going forward. And then there's like big giant companies, I'm gonna put them in the enterprise everything category, where the word enterprise gets prepended onto things that they want to be important, and suddenly there's all this weight. So that's kinda how I wanna, I wanna use like a real simple playful physics metaphor to say, let's look at the challenges we have because it's not just the man that brings us down. A lot of us carry our own baggage around with us wherever we go. So I just went through some funny jokes. Like the first joke, lesson one in physics, is mass has consequence. So if we had more time, I would ask you to think about these things, maybe even turn to the person next to you. Process is some form of mass that small projects, medium-sized programs start absorbing. And it happens like this in my little world. I go into some company and someone had a really good experience using some methodology, maybe some of this agile stuff, and then you, you suggest something different that might be an improvement, and they say, no, 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 that's not how we do agile. And suddenly you have the, you know, when you look up ironic in the dictionary, there's the agile guy that can't be agile about being agile. You know, and so 10 years later, it's a recursive nightmare that we're stuck in this process loop that we have to just kind of get out of. And so that's one simple way we add weight to things. Another one is that, you know, people are always talking about Scrum or Kanban or Lean or Safe. And so I created my own methodology called Nonban. <laughs> so you, you can't go to the website because it's such a lean process, there isn't a website. <laughs> but, and I asked one of my Indian friends, I said, would you ever serve a meal that was only naan? And he said, probably not. And I said, would you ever serve a meal that doesn't have naan? And he said, probably not. And I thought, that's an interesting perspective because it's part of a meal. It's a supplement to the meal, but it's not the meal unto itself. And so that's what kills me. Like 10 years into this, 15 years into this agile movement, everyone's on about wanting to be agile. And this, and the guy that comes up with a methodology for scaling things, it's called safe, is clueless. Right, safe is the wrong word to use because it just, it reeks of certainty. Don't worry, it's all safe. You know, you need, at scale, you need to be anything but safe. You need to be disciplined, you need to be focused, you need to be analytical, you can't be safe. So, another term that I'm fond of lately is product arrogance. And I stole it from one of my favorite authors who talks about epistemic arrogance being the difference between what you know and what you think you know. So I'm gonna float out to you guys for your consumption the idea of product arrogance, which is the difference between what people need and what you think they need. Because that's where we get into trouble all the time and it, it comes up in words like the requirements. We have the requirements, now we just have to build it. And that language is deep in our ethos. People puke up that word requirements without thinking about it and then later they have a meeting to say, is that actually required? And I explain these things to my wife and it just terrifies her that there might be software on moving vehicles. So, yeah, we just figured out that after we gather requirements, we talk about what's required and she looks at me like, oh my gosh, does anybody go to college? You know, just kind of stunning. This is a picture of a friend of mine, Jeff Patton, who's always saying interesting things and one of the things I've heard him say a bunch of times is we need a better discussion, not a better document. And that really feels right or we need measures over just documents. And I think one of the areas where I see people being successful is more of the engineers in the world are trying to figure out how to tell the product story, how to speak to kind of who we're delivering things to, what are their needs, so that we can make more informed contextual choices around systems that have less code and more value that are long-term kind of more adoptive. Because there's all sorts of different math that we absorb. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, one of the groups we work with for Disney is this animation group in San Diego. It's a small shop filled with like go faster C++ wonks who all have the most powerful machine and every toy that they've ever bought at their desk. The interesting thing for me in the gaming world is that unlike a lot of other places I work, everybody stops and plays the game together. No one does that at banks. No one sits down and says, let's be a banker for two hours on Friday. 
I mean, the gaming world has some challenges. But what was neat is I was at this company, and we had a meeting, and right after the meeting, everybody got an email about how much the meeting cost. Someone in the meeting just did the run rate of everybody in the room and sent out a note and was like, you know what, $7,000 meetings, everybody think it was worth it? And while it's sort of shocking, it's, it's real. It's like it's simple data. And I think like what we should do is start practicing like test-driven meeting. Right, you show up at the beginning of the meeting, it's like, what is, what is the success of this meeting? Is if you can't tell me, I'm all done. Failed test, I leave until you can kind of give me a reason that I'm here. I, I want to be here. I mean, that was a jobs thing. You know, if you guys read um, Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple Computing, apparently Jobs used to walk in the room and say, what are you doing here? 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 I want to say thanks very much for coming, but I'm going to ask you to leave. And he would cut meetings down to six because that, you know, death by meeting, no one, no one hates going to parties. If you say, hey, dude, want to go party? People are all in. If you say meeting, it's a little bit like pariah, you know, and so I don't really need to kind of grind on that one too much. The next one is this, and maybe this speaks to more of these people in this room. I'm around all sorts of people that go to a conference and they get hyped up by someone with really a big head, a big brain, very charismatic, a lot of chops, and they come out of that and like, we have to use insert bright shiny object. <laughs> and we have to have this new source control system, we have to use this language. And I was thinking like, if I would have had more time, I would have put in a picture of my little daughter because I was able to become super dad by showing her that I could help her learn how to create a Minecraft mod in Python. <laughs> and she looked at me like, really? And I was like, yeah, I can do that. And no other dad can, only your dad can, you know? <laughs> and I, my daughter wants to do that because she loves this game. She doesn't give a rip about Python. You know, it's, she's, we're trying to do more stuff for kids and girls and kind of coding at Dev Jam, but that feels like it's not a bright, shiny object, it's a means to an end. And so, I mean, there's lots of things that, that we add mass to our world in, but I want to kind of just move through this because I sort of feel like Jamie asked me about the word keynote, and he said he wasn't going to use it, and I hate the word keynote. I don't even know the etymology of it. It's another one of these things we puke up all the time. I sort of feel like my job is to be the disruptive discussion starter of the day. So that's what some of these ideas are sort of about. And then the second lesson is gravity sucks. And so gravity comes in the form of like, if you imagine your company is a planet, what are all the things that hold you down? And some of these things you, you might feel like you can't do something about, but there's a lot of these things you can do things about. This is a classic one. As this crazy guy that works for us says sometimes, people are just working on too damn many things. This is really common. Does anybody know why you're asked to work on more and more things? Sort of a rhetorical question, but that's a good question for you to go back and try and understand. Because it comes in this form. Someone sees the competition is doing something. And if they have concerns about whether you can get things done because delivery has been so inconsistent for so long, they just say, oh my god, we better start a new thing. Because otherwise we're not going to be competitive. And they fire a new thing down into the trenches and there's five things going on already and they push in a sixth thing and mythically in their head whether they say it or not all things move out linear and we all know that's not true but we're not showing those people the evidence to say there's an impact there's an effect to that and instead what comes out is a lot of emotional kind of unsettling information that flows up and I feel like what's happening for me right now is within Teams programs, I'm starting to produce the evidence at like a portfolio level that I can go back to someone and say, here is the direct impact of your choice in the last two weeks, in the last month, in the last two months. And it doesn't always work, but it's the best way to resolve something which otherwise feels insane to me. You can't have people working on six things at any one time, unless you're this dude. Anybody know who this is? I didn't know if this was like really the person that came up with the term human resources or worse, fully utilized human resources. That sort of feels like an economist's view of humanity. You know, I always think it's funny when someone says, how many resources are on the project? Well, there's 15 people, six printers, and eight laptops. Well, let's get more printers. <laughs> you know, printers are super good at context switching and queuing work, and you can just keep firing work at them. People aren't really like that. and so this. It's, what's funny to me is you start gathering evidence and you find that someone that has great ideas has to be fully utilized. So you suck up the last 9% of their cycles and then the time you need them, 
On the other 91%, they're sweeping the closet. And, and that's another one of these things that like, I don't know how many people here get to make that decision or unmake that decision, if you will, but if we don't start producing evidence against that, it's gonna continue on, and maybe until there's a change in leadership, because there's a lot of people that live this myth of matrixing or fully utilized resources. There's a company I worked at that wrote a piece of software to figure out how much was time someone had available, and they named the piece of software Tetris. And I was like, they said it out loud to me, and I was like, don't laugh at the client, don't laugh at the client. <laughs> I was just sort of stunned. It's like, no one thinks that's funny, man. You do that stuff in a band, you don't live that down for years. That's just open ridicule to kind of go after people. The other thing is this idea of enterprise. Does anybody know when we started using this word? Has anybody ever read the book, Metaphors We Live By? Where's Paul Cantrell? He's right over there. He gave me that book maybe... Uh, 12 years ago, and because we, we had this insane argument about metaphors, Paul was right because he's right more often than I want to admit all the time, but uh, what I liked about the book is it challenged us to say what are the words that we use all the time, the metaphors that are latent that drive us in enterprises, one of these words that popped up. It's like the word science, to give you guys a little bit of grief, is kind of something you paste onto things when you want it to look more scientific, like political science, right, because you don't call it biology science you know, or physics science. I sort of think that computing would have been better off left just as computing instead of computer science, and intelligence is another one of those words, you know, business intelligence. You have to kind of put these things together, and it's not a bad idea, but enterprise blah, blah, blah tends to cause gravity at companies. Enterprise architecture, enterprise agile, that's my favorite one. It's pretty much right up there with like military intelligence, enterprise agile. And then, in order for people to promote enterprise agile, they can't just let things happen organically, and they just, all they do is start multiplying agile things. So you have scrum of scrums, and product owner of product owners, and scrum of scrum of scrums, and at some point I'm like, dude, you gotta have more than a naming convention. You gotta have an idea, you have to figure out how to address the problem instead of just throwing kind of more process at it. There's not a lot of places, Jamie asked me yesterday when we were working together, there's not a lot of places that I think scale things well that are kind of organic and collaborative. They get up to this next level and they get fearful and so they just in start injecting complexity in the mix because it gives them a sense of security. In that book, Insanely Simple, apparently they always talk about jobs having this thing called the simple stick. And dude would come in and just start whacking away at things until you kind of reduce that level of complexity, especially accidental complexity. This is another one of my favorite metaphors, is people say, it's like a Swiss army knife. So anyone who owns a Swiss army knife? Has anybody ever tried to sew with it? <laughs> right. it's super, I mean, I was thinking, I might put a Leatherman up here, because that's kind of more of where my head is at, but that sewing needle thing doesn't work. It's goofy, right? And this is like, what happens in big companies, is like, we ought to have the enterprise tool set. Why? No one asks why. And it's tough for me because I go into a lot of ecosystems where we have to use the enterprise tools and right away just every part of me is like, oh my God, this is horrible. It's gonna be abusive for the people that are trying to get stuff done. But until I produce evidence, there's so much dangerous inertia and momentum around that idea of like, we bought this tool, therefore we have to use it, that you gotta have evidence to fight that war. You can't go into that war with just emotion. So there's a lot of evidence out there for us to use right now. So I told these guys I would stay kind of inside my time limit. So I, but I wanted to talk about a couple ideas. I don't want to just kind of whinge about things. Because one of the things that kills me is that a lot of companies are worried about wanting more velocity. One, um, they want more points. As soon as I go into an organization someone says we want more points, it's like big giant tell we're in trouble, because there's all sorts of crazy myth that more points means more of something better. And it's just like, I don't know, if you're wanting, these people that want more velocity, it's interesting to me, I think they have never had a physics class because they don't get velocity as speed and vector. It's about going somewhere at an accelerated rate. It's not just faster. My email signature says, if you don't know where you're going, it's easy to iteratively not get there. And I see a lot of groups, especially a lot of the groups I work with at scale, they got all these teams sprinting along and at some point they actually piece all this stuff together into something that's a pretty crappy user experience. 
and they've optimized building the wrong thing faster and they have a lot of tests and they have continuous delivery and they have well-formed code and all it is is wrong. And when they fix it, they're gonna call it a refactoring, which is a euphemism, man. It should just be called wrong. That was wrong, yeah, you know. Don't call it refactoring, yeah. So, a couple people that I would point you towards, well, let's just try a weird exercise. Just it, a minute right now, everybody think of your project that you're on, your product that you're building. Think of one thing you could do to go faster. Raise your hand when you thought of something. This is your moment to be impressive. Your hand should go up right away. Yeah, what's one thing you could do? Okay, raise your hand if you thought about taking something away instead of adding something. So that's, that's a pretty interesting exercise I do in a lot of places, and most people go to addition. We should do this. We're not doing this. We should do this. Um, this, this guy, Nassim Taleb, has anybody in here read Anti-Fragile other than me? Yeah, one person. You and I will have a birds of a feather session, dude. We'll hang out and say, what a great book, yeah. <laughs> dude is a pretty arrogant author. He's also pretty smart. I wouldn't want him for my friend, but I wouldn't mind arguing with him over whiskey. And one of the things he, this is a person whose whole life is about prediction, who has kind of gone on to say, if the future is not like the past, it doesn't matter how much data you have. His whole, his whole argument is about uncertainty. His, hedge fund company, which is an interesting analogy because so many large places I work, they act like they're bond traders, like they're making these safe little investments. And the reality in the software world, man, is we're like hedge fund traders. We're trying to kind of hedge our bets and the smaller sets of distributed investments we make, the better off we are. Taleb always talks about in this book, he frames things as like, over here is fragile. And most people, if you ask them the opposite of fragile, they would say robust. And he's like, that's not the opposite of fragile. In fact, in most languages, there isn't a word for the opposite of fragile. So he said, a china glass is fragile. A washing machine is robust, but a human is anti-fragile. Because you can inject a human in with a little bit of a virus, and they will become immune to it. And the washing machine, you can't do that with. It's kind of stuck. And a lot of the themes in the books are about how you take things away to have a system be its simplest, its leanest. It's kind of where I think all this Agile stuff started before it tragically became bloated. And the other person that if people here don't know about is definitely worth um, kind of investigating is this guy, Dave Snowden. Anybody read any of his stuff? We had him, he, we had him speak at Code Freeze this year. He's a former IBM researcher. He's a really sharp dude and his little framework up here he calls Kneffen. Um, next week we're going out to Intel to work with him because Intel is trying to do this, in, Intel is trying to figure out how to not be a chip manufacturer. They're trying to figure out we can't just produce chips, we have to be about producing chips that are in products. So they have a lot of really brilliant engineers that don't think product, they think chip. And Snowden's work out there, what we're going to do next week is use his technique which is kind of like trying to use narratives to understand needs. But he's got a large scale piece of software and a format to do this and he's, trying, he's doing this outside of the software space which makes it really interesting to me. And in the picture you can see in the bottom right hand corner he has simple. He's actually since replaced that with obvious. And so it cycles through, you have simple, complicated, complex and chaotic. And I think it's a really interesting set of words because he would define or the author of like the checklist manifesto would say, Simple is baking a cake out of a box you buy in a store. You don't really want to improvise. Now, that's really interesting because if you give that to an engineer, they might say, well, the, the directions are wrong. I know how to do this. So compl complicated is getting a rocket to the moon. Complex is being a parent. Because once you get the rocket to the moon, it doesn't really change too much, you know, unless there's a massive black hole that kind of comes through. Gravity is fairly constant. You know, that's something that we've done. We've solved that. Complex things are very dynamic, and then chaos is what it is. And one of the things that came up when he was at DevJam that I really liked is the discussion about the nature of software development is inherently complex and or chaotic. And what happens at a lot of companies is they accidentally slip from complicated into complex. In a lot of the work I do, you see it happen with process because they're scared. Someone can't wield it. They're not looking at the evidence, and so they just start to jam in more process, and they slip into this level of complexity. 
And the dialogue came into like, well, how does Apple deal with that? And the consensus we came to in the discussion was they deal with it by adding constraints to move things back to complicated. And I'll let you chew on that for a little bit, but I think it's a really interesting idea to view benevolent constraints, discipline, if you will, to move from complex back into complicated because complex is far more unwieldy. It's not bad to go there, just like it's not bad to absorb some debt as long as it's, you are aware of it and it's intentional. And then the last thing I wanted to do is try and kind of say all this stuff doesn't really matter unless you're going somewhere, unless you have a mission somewhere. So is anybody here from Code 42? I don't know if any of you guys were in this session, but I didn't put this picture in to just suck up. I put this in because I think these guys have escaped. They have, they, have, they have real velocity. They're going somewhere interesting. And now they have a whole new set of challenges that they didn't have when they started. And what I think is really cool about this picture is that, A, all the people that I worked with there are very courageous. There's no babies. There's a lot of people that are willing to say, yep, there's work to do, but there's uncertainty that you can't specify. You can't specify your way out of, are you building the right thing? And so this is a group of engineers learning to storytell. Design is kind of merging with development into the essence of like what we're trying to do is say, are we building the right thing for the right people and do they actually want it? Assume delivery is a You have to say, are you delivering the right thing? Guy must be shutting my mic off because it's time to be done. <laughs> sort of a hint. Okay, then <laughs> I'll leave you guys with this. And um, I don't know if you know this, some people here might know this about me. Uh, my oldest daughter's friends all started calling me the Big Lebowski behind my back. <laughs> it's sort of a dubious honor because he's an overweight, pot-smoking, right, white Russian swilling slacker, and I'm only a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> but I always try and come up with like funny things to like shock my wife, and one night before bed I was thinking about how scientists don't really argue about Ohm's law. They don't have to have a meeting about that. It's sort of a given, it's a theory, someone floated it out, it's well proven through testing. So I created my own law called Dude's Law, appropriately, and Dude's Law basically says that, you know, you should focus on why instead of how, because if all you focus is on how, and that's in the bottom of the equation, then you get a lot less value. And how is nice when you're learning something, but why first? Then a how is what I'm going to leave you guys with. And I ran over to our company and got a bunch of these like dude's law buttons that you can challenge the people you work with when someone says, we have to do this, we have to do that. You have to be agile. He has to use blah, blah, blah. So um, I'll send you guys on your way with that. Hopefully I did an okay job being the first like session zero person. I don't know if there's a thousand of these things, so I'll leave the box and run away. Don't hurt yourself because they are kind of pointy. <laughs> Enjoy the conference, man. Yeah.